You are listening to the Regeneration Rising podcast, a podcast from the Kavira Coalition about the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of agrarians in the United States. Each episode will explore what it means to work in regenerative agriculture, how people came to choose this as their livelihood, and why it's important to them and the future. We hope to build a foundation for a strong community of future agrarians and land stewards with a regenerative approach to community, relationships, and the land. Hello and welcome back to Regeneration Rising. I'm Taylor Mulia, and today we have a very special episode for you. We have another alumni of the program coming to help me guest host this episode. Graham Holtrup from a few years back is uh, coming to interview his previous mentor, Jim Spinner, at who is currently still a mentor at the Vibare Company in Eastern Montana. This conversation was so much fun. I think one of the best parts of my job is just getting to know everyone who comes through our program and laughing and having conversations and digging into hard topics. So thank you so much for joining us and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Regeneration Rising podcast. Thank you so much to the both of you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So Graham, this is a very exciting episode. You are an alumni of the New Agrarian Program, and we are having you guest host this podcast. And if you want to just get us started off, if you want to give us kind of a quick background of sort of your journey and what your apprenticeship was like, where did you apprentice and where you're at now? Yeah, so I uh, grew up in Western Washington, uh, kind of in a sub- very suburban neighborhood. And uh, after graduating college, I kind of through research and just thinking about what I want to do as a career, I thought, you know, maybe I want to do agriculture. And I kind of got really interested, especially in cattle ranching. And so the summer of 2020, I uh, interned at Alder Spring Ranch, which isn't a part of the Quivira Coalition. And I did four months there as a kind of range rider, ranch hand. And then after that, I started looking for different opportunities and ended up finding the new agrarian program and applying. And uh, I applied to Diamond D. Angus, and that's where I worked for the first half of my apprenticeship with Jim. And then uh, around in June time, me and Jim both kind of left at different times, but in the month of June. And I ended up working at a different ranch for the rest of my time during the apprenticeship program at Barney Creek Livestock. So both of those programs, I don't think are any, or or aren't in the uh, program anymore. But uh, yeah, it was very interesting, I think, to go from the big seed stock operation to a smaller kind of grass fed, grass finished, direct to consumer ranch. And then I went back to school that January after I was done with the new agrarian program. So that would be January of 2022. And I uh, have been in school ever since. I'm studying accounting and management information systems. And I'm also currently working for a local electronics manufacturer. Uh, in their accounting department as an intern. Very cool. So quite a quite a left turn there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but still probably quite relevant to ranching. Everything's really relevant to ranching in some way. But um, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to explain. So you chose Jim Spinner to be your guest today. Um, what was the reason for that? Yeah. So uh, Jim was the ranch manager at Diamond D. Angus. We worked together from April to June. Um, and he was like my direct supervisor and mentor. And I think just in working together, and we, we honestly didn't work together very long, but uh, just in working together, I think, you know, Jim is, is a really smart guy. And I feel like we had, we built a really good rapport just in, in that short amount of time. Um, and I know there's, there's a lot of knowledge up there that I think a lot of people would benefit from. Awesome. And Jim is a current mentor. So it's really cool to kind of connect it back to our current program. So Graham, if you want to just kick it off, let's let's jump into this. Uh, you want to start with your first question? Sure. Uh, how you doing, Jim? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Where are you calling us from today? We're now in eastern Montana, a small town called Lambert. And the, the name of the property here is the Fibar A Company. Can you give us a little bit of background on kind of what your career has looked like in ranching and kind of your roadmap? It's a, it was a windy road, uh, I guess, 
we'll start there. Um, I was in college studying biology and geology and became quite interested in, at the time, what I was thinking was the safety, the security of the food supply. And that kind of led me toward forage finished, grass fed, grass finished beef. I wasn't sure at the time if beef cattle were the most appropriate bovine for the North American continent. So I was uh, originally quite interested and still interested in bison. But we did, uh, after finally embarking on our own endeavors for a while, eventually switched to beef cattle. And uh, I just find that for me anyway, and the way that I like to do things, that there's a simplicity there of management with a little less in terms of infrastructure, maybe personal harm at different times. (laughs) <laughs> but, uh, so I've worked a great many places on the journey uh, from starting our own operation, direct marketing and full-time jobs, full-time job on the side. Does that sound right? Um, but uh, <laughs> so those experiences, I think, have uh, informed a lot of where we are today. But uh, I'm part of Covira because a number of people took sincere interest in what I was doing and helped mentor me along the way. And this seems like a pretty reasonable way to pay that forward. Yeah. And I think just kind of diving into the episode, I kind of want to talk about overall, like what your experience has been like as a ranch manager uh, and and kind of what working as a ranch manager looks like. I think for a lot of people that are either in the program right now or potentially interested in the program, becoming a ranch manager is the next kind of logical step after, maybe not after your apprenticeship, but that's kind of, I think for a lot of people, the end goal uh, of working in agriculture, specifically, you know, cattle ranching uh, is to, is to get to that managerial side uh, of things. And so in kind of like looking at what your day-to-day looks like, can you kind of tell us a little bit about that and specifically to not just what the day-to-day looks like, but how much time do you spend doing the day-to-day tasks like fixing fence or moving cows versus, you know, planning and strategizing and, and looking forward and to, to build the business. The, uh, you know, the busy season, the summer season, we try to have a lot of the planning and strategizing type of things kind of already done. So that's typically, uh, if at all possible, we try to take care of as much of that, the, the slightly less busy times of the winter. Day to day through much of the summer is mostly hands on, but that is partly particular to this particular ranch. Um, I'm really the only full time year round employee. So there's when we have an apprentice, then I have help. When my family's available, they help. But if something has to be done, then you know the planning and strategizing just might have to wait. Um, we do have regular meetings with the board of directors. Once a month, we'd have a Watt B working on the business meeting. And that planning and strategizing is always in the back of my mind. You know, when you're on your way someplace, you're not necessarily thinking about fixing fence. You might be thinking about something else on your way there. So that that's always running in the background and you, you find the time. I probably should schedule specific times to make sure that some of that things happen and get done. For example, we're applying for some big cost share programs right at the moment. And I've set myself a deadline to complete that because without it, you you just find something else to do. Yeah. And I guess I probably should have asked this before, but can you talk a little bit about the VBAR A and kind of what, just give the listeners a picture of, you know, where you are working and kind of what the ranch is like. Eastern Montana was never on my, uh, you know, near the top of the list of places to go. I've driven through here on the interstate and thought, boy, that's a pretty plain area, you know. This property is uh, approximately 16,000 acres, majority of which is deeded, and it is much different than what I've seen in a lot of eastern Montana. And to to be fair, I'm, I haven't seen all of eastern Montana either. Uh, there are other places that are equally as pretty, I'm sure, but there's so much varied terrain, topography, lots of coolies, timber. There are plants and animals here that 
I never dreamed we would be finding here. I mean, you, pronghorn, elk, deer, both kinds of deer, moose, wild turkeys, it, all kinds of songbirds. Um, some people tell me that that the range here is is kind of the way that people at least imagine, you know, that that the prairie is supposed to be. It's quite interesting. It's been horribly dry the first two years, and this year we've been blessed with quite a bit of moisture, and it is it's as pretty as I've ever seen it. So it's so far we're having a a lovely spring. Yeah, that's good to hear because I know yeah the the drought for a lot of people has been has been very painful. Um, and it's it's fun to manage grass, but it's very hard to if uh, you don't have enough water to grow it. <laughs> yeah, grass and dust. That's that's what I've seen. Mostly dust, but so there's some grass this year. So as you've kind of worked as a manager, I know that especially working with apprentices, uh, myself, and then uh, past and current apprentices, uh, you know, you're you're obviously managing people, and and you're working with the landowners as well. And so I think a lot of that requires a good amount of, of soft skills like communication, organization, all those sorts of things. What do you feel like are the most important soft skills being a ranch manager? And, you know, what would you recommend, you know, if someone felt like I, I could definitely improve my people skills or my soft skills, you know, what would you recommend that they work to improve upon? I think uh, communication is big, uh, really big. The the root of everything, though, I think, is that a person that comes from a place of being honest and, and with, with a high level of integrity, try to, the golden rule is pretty big. You know, it, you could talk all day if you don't, if you don't treat people the way kind of you'd like to be treated, or if uh, you don't treat folks in a way that uh, is professional. So I, I guess earlier I alluded to doing a number of other things and customer service, working with the public in different jobs and some professional communication skills from the law enforcement background, you you can get a long way with people if if you take the the time and and the, the initiative to develop a rapport. My wife is a teacher and she's really big on developing rapport with her students. And I mean she gets things done with she champions all the what other people might consider hard cases. And she just invests in them and they, it's unbelievable sometimes what they'll pay back. And I, I think you can do that with a lot of people and, and come out in a win-win type of situation. Have you ever felt like to, and I guess this would be more specific, like working with apprentices, do you ever feel like it's sometimes hard to communicate with apprentices just because you're kind of on a, I guess, a different level in terms of skill set wise. And some of these apprentices, you know, might not have had any experience with agriculture whatsoever. So even using like the word heifer, right, they might be like, what's a heifer? <laughs> I don't know. But um, have you ever, have you noticed that that has been an issue at all? And, you know, have you done anything to help kind of communicate better with people that might not understand that? I think one benefit of Coming to the Quivira program with the idea that that uh, the apprenticeship involves a fair amount of education, and that you it's it's different than hiring a seasoned hand, and when you when you come to it from that perspective, then it's a whole lot easier to start at a base level, and and grow from there, and it it's satisfying to see them you know when the light comes on. And then they start to take on more responsibility. And, and uh, sometimes they ask you questions that you haven't been able to answer yourself, you know, and you realize <laughs> that, that their understanding has developed to the point where they're asking you the questions that keep you up at night. So, <laughs> Jim, in that, in that context, what, what's been most challenging as a mentor? Like, you know, communication, we all have this ideal, but have you run into any instances where something was a lot more challenging than you thought? I think the most difficult thing is every every person is different. And for me to, like the three of us were working on something together, I could say something that Taylor may pick up on and we know Graham isn't going to. He's just, let's face it. Uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to pick up on a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm slower. <laughs> I appreciate that. Sorry, Graham. Anyway, <laughs> there's uh, to try to always put things into a, a perspective that, or a, a frame of mind that that your 
apprentice can pick up on, I think is sometimes it's easy. And sometimes particularly like if they're really having a hard time with something, so it's rewarding when it works, but you know, you feel twice as bad when, when you have a hard time try to present a thing that helps that light go on for them. Um, I, for me, I think that's mm-hmm. one of the most challenging mm-hmm. things. I take it fairly personally if, uh, um, if I'm not, if I feel like I'm ineffective. Right. You want to be a good mentor, but it's also, yeah, there's like, it's that two way street too. You might not show up the same way on the same day. You know, you might be on your game. They're not on their game. You're not on your game and they're ready for you. So it's like, that's also, yeah, that's tricky. It's uh, lots of things in life are kind of a, you know, give and take a, a bit of a dance. And I will say, I think, especially for a lot of people that are coming into the the apprenticeship program, I think a fair amount of them don't have a, an agricultural background. Um, and I know that for me, I mean, being from the suburbs, right, moving to a very rural area compared to where I grew up was really hard um, at first. And then I think another big thing, and I think sometimes it's not talked about all that often, is kind of, you know, how do you manage uh, a work-life balance in in ranching or in agriculture in general? I think uh, there's quite a few jobs out there that are definitely, you know, nine to five or, you know, you can clock out whenever and it's not going to affect anything. But how have you kind of managed work, work-life work balance when you're working on a ranch and there's animals that are uh, relying on you to stay alive? It is difficult, it, but it can be done. Uh, I'm not saying we get it right all the time. I know a guy that works at another ranch in Montana. He's he's kind of coined the phrase that he's saving the world one bite at a time. And so when you look at it like that, it kind of, it makes some of those things easier for me. It might not necessarily make it easier for my family um, who really wanted to go do, you know, X, Y, Z. And today's the day that, you know, something else blew up, broke down and might change those plans. A big Part of what we try to do, kind of like I talked about before with the deadline for the cost share application is just plan it. Like things don't, things often don't happen that we don't plan. If you just, if you're just kind of waiting for it to happen, it, it doesn't happen. So we try to put like, it gets moved, but like we, we have a date night set for my wife and I. So like, we don't always do it on the same night. Sometimes it's got to get moved. Sometimes it gets missed. And it, you also try to take advantage of little opportunities when you can. So it, it it's not easy, but I, I think planning is the big thing. Like if we put something on the calendar, then, then we, you know, come hell or high water, we really try to make sure that that happens because we might, we might decide to like take a van, family vacation once a summer. And to be honest, that was one of the few things, the only thing that I, negotiated for when we were looking at this job was a little bit of extra vacation and we don't ever seem to use it. So, uh, you, you, <laughs> not all of it. You I mean, you got to put it on the calendar. You got to decide that that's important and make sure that it happens because otherwise, I guess, I think the way my family thinks about it is that I'm putting me and my job before everybody else. And clearly that is, uh, difficult road to travel so (laughs) yeah and I even that kind of reminds me of a time when we a big reason why I you know I got interested in ranching is you know saving the the world one bite at a time and the way that you know managed grazing can have such a good impact on not only cattle nutrition but also the land and you know all these different regenerative cycles but uh, you can kind of get into that headspace of like well we need to move them every single day and I remember one time, I think it was Sunday or Saturday, it was the weekend. And, you know, instead of we gave them, we were going to give them a portion of a pivot to graze on. And you said, well, let's just double it. So we don't have to move them tomorrow because I want to actually go do things with my family tomorrow. So uh, ideally, right, you know, we would love to move them once a day, twice a day, but sometimes, you know, we'll let them chew on the grass a little extra longer just so we can, you know, take a break and, and, you know, keep, the things that are important to us in life, you know, spend time doing that and and prioritize those things. Well, there are other things I like to do also. And (laughs) you you do do need to take a breath now and again. Uh, Some people are better about it than others, but uh, it, 
it's nice to go do something else. Tim, what what are your hobbies? What what do you do, like to do outside of work? Uh, lot, well, lots of things outside. Um, lots of things that still kind of involve, oftentimes the ranch, which sometimes draws the ire of my wife. But uh, she she just wants to go someplace <laughs> sometimes. So I I like to camp. I mean, I like like backpack, like walk someplace, not drive there and sleep on asphalt. Like I want to go out and be in the back country someplace. Um, uh, we and we kind of like to hunt and fish the same way when we can. Um, right or wrong, I brought a ski boat with me to <laughs> to the dry, dry prairie. I just, it's yes. there are hours uh, of of miles to travel to find a place to put the boat. But uh, you know, we we'll do that at least a couple times a summer. Still, uh, I don't think I can. I don't think I can sell the boat until the kids are gone. <laughs> The first um, time I kneeboarded so, was on uh, off the back of Jim's boat. <laughs> no way. <laughs> That's awesome. There were two Quivira apprentices there that day and they neither one of them had done it before and they <laughs> they both they both did well. Oh, there's nothing better. That's like that's one of my favorite things to do over the summer. You just forget about everything cuz it's just so fun to be out there. It's yeah, I where where is the closest lake to the ranch? Uh, roughly three hours. I mean, it's a, it's, it's an all day <laughs> yeah. thing. If we go now, it's an all day thing. So, it's, yeah, nice. It, in Northern Wisconsin, we could have the boat in the water within 10 minutes, totally. you know, and you, we didn't, we just left the boat hooked up. You get home from work, you go to the lake for an hour or two and come back. Yep. Um, yep. And so it's, it's a little different deal now, but <laughs> yep. yeah. But talking about like also in, just, um, you know, finding time to take time off from your job, you know, what, what do you enjoy most about your job? And I know, you know, it's kind of easy to kind of get sucked in, but what do you enjoy most and kind of maybe what, what is something you, you could do without, you know, when it comes to, to being a, a ranch manager? Oh, well, the list of things I enjoy are probably fairly long. Um, <laughs> and everybody's probably heard them, you know, for me, a, a lot of it is ecological, like the, the more that the, the land and the grass is working, for the livestock and wildlife, then I think I kind of like the phrase uh, "natural capital" or "biological capital." I think I think if we invest in that, that it can help take care of the ranch, it's particularly in rough years. So that's where a lot of my interest lies in terms of the you know the ranching side of things. Um, the the downfalls um, I. If I were to pick one thing the, that I dislike the most right now, it would it would be uprooting my family a couple times and moving them around. Um, I, it was really something that my wife was uh, not in large favor of. But um, but you know, kids are pretty resilient. They're they're uh, they're definitely learning things from these experiences and moving and making new friends. And I, I don't necessarily think that's bad. It's but you know, you leave family behind and. You see some of those people that are important to you a whole lot less than than you once did, and that's tough. Yeah, I can definitely, you know, even like me moving out to Montana and then you know being away from my family even for you know not even longer than a year. I was like, I want to go back home. I want to see them. You know, every chance I got, and um, yeah, it, it can. I I definitely feel that you know that it, it can be pretty tough. Yeah, it it just happened that my wife and I met in her hometown and like she moved a total of a mile from her parents place to to our place eventually you know and like all of her family is there so my family is spread out kind of all over the country and uh those of them that are left anyway and and some of them travel north south for the winter you know so i i for me it wasn't as much of a shock but uh for for my wife and my kids who grew up with everybody right there it, it's a little different, but I think something also that's, you know, really interesting about your career specifically. And what I found interesting was that, you know, both at, at Diamond D and now at, at V Bar A, I think when you came into both those places, there was this kind of, maybe not expectation, but a big part of the reason why you were hired there was that the owners were looking for you to implement, you know, some of these regenerative practices. And so obviously transitioning you know, a business model and transitioning a ranch from, 
maybe some more conventional practices to some more regenerative practices that doesn't happen all in one year. And I can only imagine how daunting that is and just how, I mean, I wouldn't even know where to start. And so I think it's really interesting uh, that you've kind of done it to two places now and two very different places as well, just with the topography and, and the, the two very different business models. And I was wondering if you kind of talk about doing it at both those different ranches and kind of how you approach that. I mean, where did you even start? I didn't, I wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> well, I'll try not to dive off into the weeds here too far, but so Diamond D was, like you mentioned, a seed stock operation. So there are definitely some different aspects to the business, but I think it's sometimes we get caught up in the differences of things and forget about the similarities. And so that at the end of the day, the cows, they eat grass, they need grass, they need water, and they might need some cover, you know, at different times of the year. So keeping the cows fed, obviously, is is an important deal and watered is part of that. So uh, at Diamond D, the terrain was quite a bit more forgiving. And the fact that much of that was irrigated made each acre very productive. So like, I thought we were able to get quite a bit of stuff done in a relatively short amount of time, partly because, you know, when you're talking a, a pivot that covers a f- couple few hundred acres, that's different than a pasture that's several thousand. And the pivots were at one point farmed, so they were pretty flat. <laughs> uh, this place is the opposite of flat. And so here we're concentrating on on breaking paddocks down in ways that uh, right or wrong, incorporate a lot of existing infrastructure. Like some people will tell you to just ignore all that and just put the place together, you know, the way that it makes the most sense. And I understand where that I, advice is coming from, but I, it didn't seem incredibly practical. Um, so working within some of the confines of existing infrastructure, like where's the water now and how can I best make that water work for me in a, a more intensive type of arrangement. Um, that's that's been a big part of what we're trying to do here and all the while you know some of the grazing principles are still the same so we want to control the length of the graze we want to control the rest period and here in particular since all of this is is just rangeland there are improved pastures in places but there's no irrigation so for the most part you know if it doesn't rain we're not getting growth and we are part of a a rest rotation program or so that we have a set of every year we have a set of early pastures and then a set of late pastures and a portion of the ranch is rested and then the following year the early pastures are the late pastures and the late pasture is now rested so that i think there was a lot of similar thinking uh, when we were looking at taking this job or you know considering if it was offered whether or not there was something we really wanted to pursue that was a big part of the decision making process was that this seemed like a place where we could go and and get along and be successful get along well so you'd say you kind of i think at the end of the day you kind of and i think i mean every op- operation even ones that have been you know doing regenerative agriculture for a long time you know are still improving their grazing processes their production processes uh, but you would kind of say that you know grazing and, and livestock water are kind of the the priorities when it comes to figuring out how to do everything operationally and then kind of figure out the rest from there. Yeah. When I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, yeah, like one thing I'm, I'm wondering is that they have any electric fence. Had they ever used electric fence at Vibari before you got there? Was it a completely new thing for the cows? Um, was there any resistance to any type of regenerative practices that you wanted to do? And then you were like, okay, let's back up. I, I don't think really any resistance so far. A lot of things were put in motion before we got here and we've, I think, just taken it to another level. The board and previous manager put a fair amount of groundwork into things, but I don't know that they had some of the lessons, hard-earned lessons um, that, that we came with. And so one of the, there was polywire in place. And I think they were having pretty good luck with it. But I believe also that things had been generally a little wetter 
in previous years. And our first summer here, I eventually quit putting up polyware. I, I know that's a heretic kind of thing to say, but they they were jumping it. They were chewing on it. They were walking through it. They were doing whatever they wanted. It was horribly dry. We were using some small portable solar chargers with, you know, ground rods that weren't reaching any kind of wet soil, I don't think, and insufficient grounding when you're, for the most part, I think in most temporary systems, grounding is always an electric fence issue in a portable type of deal. So I've, I've talked to people that try to keep goats in with portable fences and they're like, we can't keep these things in. Uh, so it, in dry conditions, I think that's a just a common issue. So one of the first things that I said, I thought that we needed in a few places where we have power, I wanted to put actual ground rod, like a full ground rod array. And then we, we bought a, a high dollar, I call it the cow melter electric fence charger. It's, it, it'll cover a lot of ground and it'll, it'll knock you down. So we went through a serious training exercise. Um, and after the first night, when we did not have 100% compliance, then we, we resorted, I've never done this before, but we resorted to the tin foil smeared with peanut butter. We ran tin foil flags <laughs> all over the poly wire, smeared it with peanut butter and said, come get it. And uh, they didn't bother it again. They, I think if they didn't get melted, they saw somebody get melted and that was enough. So <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Like how is every animal attracted to peanut butter? Like what is it about peanut butter? It's like no matter the species, <laughs> universally beloved. No idea. I, <laughs> I was glad I heard somebody try it. Yeah, oh. I, I was glad I heard somebody try it because I, I was starting to run out of options. But uh, yeah, and did that work? Like ever after that, you felt good. You know, cows are staying in. Yes, good? ma'am. Yes, ma'am. They've yeah. been they've been quiet as church mouse <laughs> since. Uh, the then we took delivery in September of last year of 156 uh, bred heifers who didn't know anything about electric fence, and they immediately went into a small training area and they've been quite good also um awesome i feel like awesome. i feel like i get trained i've gotten trained to poly wire i mean after getting shocked like three times i i will never even if i yeah. think it's I, even if i know it's off i'm like hesitant to touch it if someone tells me it's hot or not hot you know i, I don't believe them i have to check it myself <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i feel like everybody is waiting for me to trick them into getting shocked and i i i swear up and down i will not trick you into getting shocked <laughs> you, you can see people they look at you like you said it's off and then they really you know yeah. carefully timidly reach out like come on man let's get some work it's, done. Your, I, it's your humor jim i feel like i would not know if you were joking or not. i'd be oh. like I, you're just you're a brick wall like i have no idea if you're joking or not you have like that dry sense of humor <laughs> that is intentional sometimes but <laughs> I, I guess I don't know I'm doing it all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. And I think, you know, just you talking about, you know, just the, the things you have to do as a manager and, and adjust and, you know, even just like those those cool tricks, like using the peanut butter to, to train cows to hot wire. I think there's so many, you know, cool tricks like that of the trade and having to come up with creative solutions, I think is, is a huge part of ranching. I think more than I would say a lot of jobs, just because like, things can go wrong at any moment and any simple task can just turn into this, you know, fiasco. It seems like if something goes wrong and, and that can be, I think, hard for some people, especially apprentices, you know, what would your advice be and how have you kind of dealt with that when, when things don't go the way they're planned? I know, you know, a particular story comes to mind for me where, you know, we were going to move the cows and I don't know how the fence gate broke, but it did. And all these, you know, pregnant cows were just walking right into the neighbor's beautiful little wheat field that was all wet. And, you know, it just, there's about six inches of growth and they started eating it all up and pugging the entire field up. And I was, I was pretty stressed. That was a pretty stressful moment. <laughs> I, I still don't know how that gate broke. It seems like someone... I don't know. I, I, I don't know how, but you know, how do you, how do you deal with moments like that? And you know, what would be your advice uh, during moments like that? Because it can be uh, pretty aggravating sometimes, you know, when things you think I'm just going to go move the cows and then it turns into a, a two and a half hour uh, debacle. 
can and will happen, right? That Murphy's Law, something like that. Yes. Um, there's, yes, nerves are at all time high in a situation like that. There's only a certain amount of that stuff that you can control. And for me, you know, you just unload a whole bunch of that stuff that you can't do anything about right now. And it, for me, it just, I mean, literally unloading is the word. It feels like it takes so much weight off when, okay, I know, you know, X, Y, Z totally went south. Everything is in the fan right now, but uh, there's a few things that have to happen. So we, you know, you start knocking one thing off the list and the next thing off the list. And next thing you know, you know, the snowball is rolling downhill instead of you pushing it uphill. So I just that I think for me, that was like the pinnacle of of just pandemonium. And I just like couldn't <laughs> believe that that had happened. Um, that was kind of a rough day. And one of them started calving in the field, too. Yes. Like, I, in, in all that chaos, one was like, I'm just going to lay down oh and my God. have my baby here. This is oh where I, I picked my spot. <laughs> <laughs> And like, Jim, I mean, like you, you didn't come from agriculture. I feel like some people, and I, it's kind of, and I don't even think it's a trend of, that grew up in agriculture. It's just like certain people in the world that are able to handle the chaos or able to like either that or, you know, the really chaotic moments, but, or just meter it on a day-to-day -day basis and just like, let go of the things you can't change, let go of the things that can't happen today and move on with things that can happen today and don't get overwhelmed. I'll see certain apprentices where I'm like, you have it. And I, it's just a, it seems to be a personality thing. Do you feel like you always had that or is that something that you had to build over time? I, I don't know if I've always had it. I guess it, I don't know, makes sense, kind of comes maybe slightly naturally. Um, but I'm telling you that this far under the surface, you know, we're, we're short just this far from panic, you know, like just... <laughs> You just got to swallow that. Uh, that you, There's a comedian fellow that we like to listen to, and he says, right now, you just need to do some man uh, stuff and swallow that. Keep that down. We're just rolling smooth, right? You just, I don't, it doesn't matter what's going on inside. <laughs> what you're getting on the outside is, you know, sunshine and rainbows. So <laughs> keep trucking, everybody. Yeah, keep trucking. Exactly, exactly. But you don't know. <laughs> yeah have you ever has that been has that been a challenge for you or did you feel like you adapted pretty quickly in terms of like understanding how to yeah ha have longevity in this career because you can't make it very long if you're you know constantly under that stress and not managing it well uh I might have said that it kind of made sense and maybe sort of comes naturally but it's something I have to think about you know if there are, there are certainly times when you're in the moment and it's pretty clear that, you know, this has to happen right now or we're going to have a real wreck, you know, something like that. But um, it may look all professional, smooth and graceful if you're doing it well. But, you know, it it's you're thinking about it while you're doing it. Um, and that it's also we talked earlier some about soft skills like I'm I've read some of Jocko Willink's stuff and like that some of that I think is really powerful. I know I don't do any of it perfectly. I, I told the apprentice the other day, I said, I can, I'm not a master of anything, but I can get us through a fair number of things here. <laughs> and so I, I guess the working knowledge of some of that type of extreme ownership type stuff is, uh, um, would be pretty handy. I think we've kind of talked about, you know, what it's like, what the the other side of ranching is like not necessarily, you know, the beautiful picturesque scene, moving the cows and, and, and all that, but also kind of the, the things that, that can go wrong and how to persevere through that. And cause it's not always going to be, you know, work's not always going to be fun. Can you, I guess, talk a little bit about, you know, how you had how, that transition into ranching as a first generation person, someone who didn't grow up doing it and, and just kind of learning those lessons and you know what were some of the things you felt like were, were an advantage for you because you didn't come from that kind of background and maybe what are some things that you know were hard because you didn't grow up in ranching some of the benefits i think are the you know you've heard before like i didn't have to unlearn the way we always did things um and i i kind of say that tongue-in-cheek but the there's truth in that like i 
I was studying life sciences before I kind of made this turn this direction. And it's the, it just uh, intuitively, a lot of the way that kind of regenerative stuff works makes sense. Like, you know, why do cows have four stomachs? Cause they're supposed to eat grass. Oh, okay. So let's, let's have cows on grass as much as possible. Like that seems pretty simple. Um, but the, uh, the difficult things are you know, having the school of hard knocks like every day, <laughs> you know, nobody, my, my dad wasn't there saying, oh, I wouldn't do that because, oh, guess what? You just smacked yourself in the thumb with a hammer because, you know, it's your first time using a hammer like that. You name it in agriculture, you're fixing a machine, you're trying to graze grass well. You're trying to take care of cows well, and you know every. It seems like every day you find a new thumb to smack with that hammer. So it's just the way it is. Either you decide to keep learning, or you know you can go do something else. I guess. Yeah, yeah, and that is really hard. I think as just you know coming in and feeling like I don't know how to do anything, and then I think it's also really helpful to just, especially you know looking back, you know a month at least for me, you know, I was pretty clueless, even when I showed up to, to work with, with Jim and just looking back, you know, a month after I had been there, three months after I'd been there, or even looking back on my whole time in the apprenticeship program. And, you know, I still had a long way to go, but I felt like, oh, look at all the things I've done. I think that's kind of important to remind yourself of, of where you started and, and how far you've come. Otherwise, you can kind of get bogged down by, there's always that next thing. I'm, I'm not good enough at that. And you know, don't, don't ever be afraid to research a thing or, or to seek help. Like one of the biggest lessons for me, I think was one of the first pasture walks I went on in Wisconsin and was like, Oh yeah. Like I, I don't have to reinvent the wheel like every day. Like some people have learned these lessons and are willing to share some of this stuff, you know? So like when we went to diamond D and to start, setting things up there. I knew that there was a fair amount of irrigation there. And I knew there were people that had already been setting up irrigated fields for managed grazing. And one of them happens to be, you know, a, a very well-known grazing expert, Jim Garish, and that he provides information on how you might set up a pivot for, and it, it was one of those forehead slapping moments when I, you know, that, I'd been doing long, narrow grazing corridors that made the polywire move simple. And just all you did was adapt it to the circle of the pivot. So instead of it being a long, straight grazing corridor, it's now just a long, curved or circular corridor. Anyway, that for me, that made a ton of sense. And I was like, oh, my gosh, why didn't I think of this? You know, like the cost of the, the guide that they put out, like it was relatively simple to put in. And you had the experience with those grasses and, and managing the polywire part of things. It was just how best to utilize, you know, this circular area. And that was, for me, that was the thing it was like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. This guy's a genius. Like, this is why people ask him for advice. So, <laughs> And it's such a simple solution too. I mean, when you first told me, cause I had uh, previously grazed on pivots a little bit too. And it's like, every time the pivot just rips my fence out and I spent, you know, 20, 30 minutes putting that in. And now it's just, it's just gone. And just, and then when you showed me that, I was like, wow, that is, how did I not think of that? Like, that's so simple and so easy. And it's, and it's cool. Those like little tricks and then and, and learning from other people like that. And, and those cows were super well trained to electric fence. Like, so they were pretty forgiving. Like if you, you could set the wire really, really low at a pivot track, if you needed to, to let it cross your poly wire. Like the only fences that the pivots ever crossed were poly wire. So if you needed to set it super low, they still weren't going to bother it. Like they, that was, that was very nice. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that, that is a really good point though, too, is like that. I feel like every, as young people getting into this, it feels like we need to know everything. You know, you need to know mechanics, you need to know grass, you need to know animal health and what happens if an animal's sick. And then you've got the accounting side and the business side and all that kind of stuff. It can be a little overwhelming and you feel like you've got to be a professional in every one of those arenas. And yeah, I'm, I'm learning more and more that there are so many people out there that can help you too. There's so many people involved in agriculture 
that all they are there to do is to provide you technical service and to help you get into this and answer your questions or find the people that can answer your questions. So, or big, you know, conservation projects you really want to do, don't have the money. There are people out there that can help. And it's, I don't know, it, it seems kind of silly to do it alone. Like it seems actually that's the worst way to do it, but that's the first thing we think of is doing it alone. There's, so that ranching for profit, people say the answer is in the team. So, you know, you seek some advice or, or go uh, see something else. And somebody somewhere has probably done it. You know, whether you're trying to not feed hay or you're going to graze a pivot or whatever the case may be. So there's probably someone, you know, within, well, in Montana, it might be a long drive, but there's somebody that's done it. So it can be, yeah, it can definitely be intimidating. I think with all the different skill sets you have to have, not, you know, as a, as a ranch hand or even as, especially as a ranch manager too, you know, if you think about it, you're managing, you know, you're managing people, you're managing sometimes a huge uh, tract of land, you're managing animals, all this infrastructure and, you know, you need to make it all run. And I think what would, you know, would be an interesting perspective, you know, if you could think of yourself as an apprentice today and let's say you were applying to the Quivira coalition maybe, and knowing what you know now, what would you, let's pretend you know everything, but you don't know everything. And what would you kind of focus on or what would you try to push yourself to really learn first like if you were starting out well uh for me managed grazing is is a huge lever like in terms of the potential profitability you know reducing costs maybe adding to the actual carrying capacity of the ranch eventually and even if you do a good job you might increase the carrying capacity in very short order just because you can use things more efficiently uh, if you go from 30 or 60 day graze periods to a week, you're picking up a fair amount of harvest efficiency there. And if you go from there to daily moves, then there's still improvement to be made just right now, just by changing some of those things. I'm not saying you can necessarily just go out and do it overnight, but for me, just like we said before, cows have four stomachs because they eat grass, right? So maybe that's one of the, maybe that's one of the top things on the list to learn about. Um, the main thing is just keep learning. And I wouldn't, I think a mistake that I've made is that, you know, everybody wants to be happy. And so like, I might not be terribly happy working in a feedlot, but there's a ton of things I would learn working in a feedlot. And especially not having grown up around a lot of those different things, your eye for diagnosing things, just being able to rattle off what you should use to treat a certain thing right now, you know, um, having seen certain, like a bad presentation when a cow is calving, something like that, you know, and to be able to spot that, I would say, go seek out those experiences, go find that knowledge at wherever you can get it. Know that when you do that, some places maybe aren't a forever home, you know, for whatever reason, you you're not happy there. They're not happy with you. Something else changes. You meet somebody, you move off, you know, you get married, whatever. All, lots of things happen in life. But you one thing that nobody can take from you is your experiences and your knowledge. And if if there are so many things to learn to do this job, then you best start wading in. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I feel like, you know, when I was looking at places to apprentice, and maybe somebody can relate to this, but it, it almost felt like you know, I want to learn about regenerative agriculture, right? Not just, you know, the kind of conventional way of raising livestock. You know, I want to be moving the cows every day type of operation is, you know, that's what, where I wanted to work. And so I kind of almost, I was, I was, I would say I was pretty selective, I guess. And like, I, it has to be these places. And it, for whatever reason, just from the little bit I read about this place, I don't think this will be a good place. And I, I would never, you're like, I, I don't, I don't think I'll get as good at education there or, or something like that. But I think that is a really good thing to think about is like, I think wherever you go, there's a lot of, there's knowledge everywhere. Right. And so I think whatever opportunity it is, you know, there's, you just kind of have to, I guess, take it as it is. Yeah. And you'd be surprised. You, the things that you can learn going someplace that, you never dreamed that you wanted to be, whether it's a job, you know, or a place. Um, 
I hired a kid one year. I, I think he, I think he'd moved to number five on the list and he had like a serious medical, he'd, he'd been injured. And like part of why he'd moved down the list was we were just waiting to see if he was even cleared to go to work. And like the top other candidates kept falling off my list for other reasons. And we ended up with number five and he was great. My kids still talk about him. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, he, he was knowledgeable. We learned things. He learned things. I thought we had a lot of fun. I wouldn't mind working with him again. And so you, you know, you, you can't, well, you can't judge the book by its cover, Graham. And you got to look a little deeper. <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. I'm curious as to why, what, was I fifth on the list or I know you weren't talking about me, but you know, where was I on the list to begin with? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't remember, but oh, my children still okay. talk about you also. <laughs> so, um, I, you were, you were high on the list. Like the, your experience was applicable. And like, I, I just, from when we did talk, I thought, you know, this is, this would probably work out. And, you know, you've, you've gone to the dark side. You were you nine to five. <laughs> what does that mean? You don't I work do, 24 I work hours? 7 30 to 4 so it's actually a little <laughs> bit different but uh yeah <laughs> you, you give yourself credit for getting up kind of early yeah, is that what yeah. you're saying they won't let me come in any earlier actually <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's <laughs> that way wait, wait did you just adjust the schedule so you could say you don't work a nine to five <laughs> just, like hey, could i just come in earlier just so i can say that i don't well it's actually work. funny because uh, eve today i was finishing something up and i think i mean it is definitely just from working in agriculture like you know we're gonna we're just gonna get this done like i'm not gonna you know we're gonna do it till the job's done kind of mentality and it was like, I was supposed to leave at four and it was like four ten, And my boss was like, it's four. It was like, oh, I'm just finishing this one thing up. She's like, you can just go home and it'll be there tomorrow. I was like, oh yeah, I, I guess you're right. Such a foreign concept. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nothing dying. No, nothing's like in the neighbor's yard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I know for me, that was kind of that, that, you know, whole work-life balance. And I, you kind of mentioned this earlier and I kind of forgot to talk about it, but you kind of mentioned like that, you know, sometimes, you know, you may work a longer day, but some of the things that you do at work, you know, don't feel like work. And I know that, you know, when I worked in ranching that it definitely felt that way. Like I felt like, you know, if I was moving the cows, you know, later to say, you know, that was the last thing I had to do. And it was four o'clock and moving the cows, you know, I was done by five o'clock. It felt like, I got off at work at like four o'clock. Like I would move them. I wouldn't even like try to do it fast. I would just, you know, do it slow and, and, you know, almost enjoy it. Um, and I think that is kind of a benefit to, you know, working in ranching, especially if you're passionate about it, is that, you know, a lot of the tasks like moving cows, kind of just grazing management, um, a lot of those things, you know, you could go a long part of the day and feel like you're not at work. You you know, you feel that, I don't know. There's, you know, some things, right. That you have to do where you, you don't want to do it and, it and it feels like work, but could you talk a little bit more about that and kind of like the satisfaction, I guess you get from moving cows onto, uh, onto a fresh pasture. I know that's always like, for me, you know, really satisfying is just doing things like that. <laughs> it, yeah. It makes you feel good to see them feeling good. You know, you, you start calling and, and they know, they, they you, you can almost hear their stomachs rumbling. They're like, ooh, that can't wait. That's part of it. Like the, and I, improving those things, like to know that you, you learned, you took the time to learn something that improved either their reaction or their experience or your ability to manage the grass. And like they leave that paddock and you, you you're looking through the old paddock and, hey, look, you know, this, I, I haven't seen, um, but like this year it's, it's, I know it's not me. I know it's cause it's raining, but like <laughs> I'm seeing cow trails, I'm seeing cow trails fill up with sprouts and like, I'm sure it's a moisture thing, but there actually are some plants this year that I don't remember seeing the last couple of years. I'm sure that's a moisture thing. Don't sell, that, Don't sell yourself short. Don't sell yourself short. Nah, like that. <laughs> I'm sure that's a moisture. I'm sure it's a moisture thing. But the fact that the place is resilient 
Like 2021 was God awful. I've never seen anything like it. I'd really prefer not to ever do anything like that again. Last year, we got a little moisture. I thought I had quite a bit of stockpiled grass and the grasshoppers ate it all. Like by the time the end of August came around and I'm like, you know, I haven't been looking, really looking at at the north end of the ranch where we're going to be grazing this winter. But there's nothing but stems. Like the leaves are gone. The only the, the stuff that's left is the stuff that even that the grasshoppers wouldn't eat. And, you know, that was kind of a dismal feeling. But you get some moisture this year. And the, like I said, cow trails are starting to fill with sprouts again. We're changing with our portable water and stuff. We're changing kind of their movement patterns because they're not traveling those cow trails necessarily anymore to reach water because we've changed either the shape of the paddock or where the water is in the paddock. And that's, I'll take a little credit for that. That's part of why they're not using those cow trails. They're going someplace else. So, um, you know, that's some of that feedback. Sometimes the feedback loop is, is pretty, pretty small. Like you, you can see stuff that's going on that, that you think you had a hand in or that maybe even the people before you had a hand in. Cause I, there's, there's definitely things we're doing new, but there, there's work that people have been putting in for years here. And just even to be part of all of that starting to pay off feels good. Whether I, whether it was me or not, like this is a, this is, this is not my project. This is a long-term, you know, team effort. And uh, I'm just happy to see that things are moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know if, if you felt like this, but like, I don't know when I, I mean, I was at Diamond D for like two, two and a half months. And I felt like when I was leaving, I felt like I had this connection with the land and the cows, even though I didn't own either. And I was like, leaving, I was like, those are my cows. Like, <laughs> I'm leaving my cows. <laughs> this is my, like, this is my land. Like, I know it's not, but I don't know. You know, you just kind of build that connection, I guess. Yeah, there's an attachment for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Don't sell yourself short, Graham. That was real. <laughs> I will say that there was a two-week time period in between when, where I was kind of left alone to my own devices uh, w- without Jim there, and I thought, you know, I could, I could. Oh, I've, I've been doing this long enough now. I, I could, I could do. You know, I, I think I can do some of Jim's job, right? I, I kind of know what I'm doing. And um, a lot of things went wrong. It was very hard. It was very hard to just, I was surviving every day. It was just like, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to make this up as I go. <laughs> and you could do Jim's job on all the best days, but his the real part of the job is when is between those days. That's the actual job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. This, I guess this would be kind of a, a helpful question for our listeners, but whenever you were looking for they'll be looking for, you know, places to apprentice or places to, to get a job to hopefully learn. What do you feel like when you were looking at, at different jobs? And, and now that, you know, just from, you know, your different experiences, you know, what should someone look for when they're looking for, whether it's an apprenticeship or kind of a, an entry level job in ranching, or even for apprentices that have had some experience and are looking for that maybe assistant manager or becoming a manager, you know, what, what should they look for? in terms of of a workplace or in a, in a ranch. I I don't want this to sound selfish or only self-serving, but you need to know partly what either you want to get out of it or what it is that you would like to do there. Um, Like how do you see yourself fitting in? Like we talked earlier, if, if it's a situation where you're after a certain experience and to increase your knowledge base, and, and it might be, you know, a temporary thing. Like maybe you're going to be a seasonal calving help or something like that. And you know that that's a short-term deal. And, you know, it might involve a lot of nights and a lot of bodily fluids and this kind of thing. But um, you, you go into it knowing that, and that's that would be a, like a different kind of set of expectations than you might for some place you were going to move your family to and maybe spend some time. Like, so I think that's important. Like you you got to look yourself in the mirror there and and kind of know what you're doing. Uh, and you should get something out of it. 
that doesn't mean that you shouldn't contribute. And matter of fact, to be successful, you you pretty damn well better contribute, right? So if and if this job is going to maybe be a job, say it is something kind of temporary that you're expecting to get experience from, to make sure that that you represent yourself and that employer as best you can, if you want to use that as something to show the next one that look, you know, this is this is my track record. Don't lose sight of how that will influence your future. You know, do the best you can every day, wherever you're at, and let the results speak for themselves. Awesome. Thank you both so much. I'll wrap up here, but just wanted to say thank you both for your time and for putting a lot of thought into this interview. It was really nice to get to know both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again so much to Jim and Graham for that awesome conversation and being willing to be on our podcast today. If you would like to keep up with either of them, you can find more information about the Vibare Ranch at vibare.com. That's V-E-E-B-A-R-A-Y.com. And you can follow Jim on Instagram at Jim underscore Spinner. And you can find Graham on LinkedIn. And all of these links are in our show notes. If you're looking for a way to get involved in regenerative agriculture, whether that is through a job, internship, educational event, or conference, you have come to the right place. Kivira Coalition has spent decades building a network within the regenerative agriculture community, and we love to share job, internship, and apprenticeship opportunities with our community through this podcast and our monthly newsletter. You can sign up for that newsletter at kiviracoalition.org slash get-enews. Snaplands is hiring a rangeland field technician. This is a seasonal position from now through October. The position consists of conducting rangeland monitoring and data entry for managers seeking to sustain, restore, or gain regenerative status on agricultural lands. This position requires extensive travel within the Great Plains and Rocky Mountain region throughout the duration of this position. To find out more, visit snaplands.com. Central Colorado Conservancy is hiring a natural resources conservation manager. This person will be responsible for advancing conservation and natural resource programs and providing technical assistance to private landowners in Lake County, Colorado. To learn more, visit centralcoloradoconservancy.org. Thank you for listening to Regeneration Rising, a podcast production of the Kavira Coalition. We'd like to thank our guests for taking the time to talk with us about their experiences. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and other popular podcast platforms. Become a Patreon supporter by visiting kaviracoalition.org slash podcasts. We'd also like to thank Kavira staff members Leah Ritchie, Taryn Dixon, Taylor Mulia, Lynn Whitbeck, and Caroline Caldwell for their contributions to producing this podcast. This episode was edited and engineered by Caleb Wenzel Fisher. Wanderlust, our theme music, was made by Scott Buckley. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the land.